Hey everyone, welcome back to OTD History. Finally getting to do another Sicily live stream. So happy to have Mark Zilke back on the channel. He's been on twice now. Um, I'll link the other stuff down below. Uh, I've talked about the Sheld and something in Normandy. I can't remember because Mark covers it all and knows it well. So <laughs> it's good to have all that different stuff. So today we're going to be talking about uh, pretty two pretty well-known Canadian fights. I don't know how well known they are kind of outside those who are interested in Canadian military history, particularly that of the Second World War, World War II, uh, of uh, Asoro. I got to make sure I say that correctly. And Liana Forte. Um, these are really, really interesting fights. One of them is immortalized in Farley Mowat. And for those of you who watched the World War II uh, TV live stream with Mark, I believe it was two days ago. Um, that does all the background. So we're going to just kind of jump right into these two uh, two fights. We'll probably do a little bit of how, you know, they kind of work their way up, the Canadians, but uh, all the background, all that other stuff, and then the post uh, elements of the fighting that goes on over these kind of twin peaked areas uh, was covered over on uh, on uh, Woody's channel the other day. So yes, and someone's asking, this is the deep dive into those two topics. So I'm just going to get Mark pulled up here. So thanks again, Mark, for coming back on the channel. Always great to have you on and uh, chatting, You're welcome. About, uh, chatting about uh, Canadian battles, uh, which, which you know just a little bit about. <laughs> can see your uh your stacks of your work there above your head uh, you yeah um, i think you i think you got it covered um so yeah this one's an interesting one um i think that's kind of putting it mildly <laughs> um like i said this is one of the the ones i think it's pretty well known for the enthusiasts of of canada and world war ii particularly anyone really interested in canada and italy i think it's even enough to stick out um from the, some of all the crazy stories that happened in the mainland like artona you know, the gothic line all that stuff um so um again we've had you on the channel before this one i mean we were kind of figuring out what we wanted to talk about and i kind of just mm. let you, you know, pick <laughs> yeah. so i mean i guess like we can start with why these two i mean i i get i know why but you know what i mean like why did you want to talk about them particularly for this live stream well for the um if you take a, any three-day period in sicily um the Canadian, in the Canadian operations, the uh, period June 20th to June 22nd, end of day, um, that's the most costly t days of the uh, Sicily campaign for 1st right. Canadian Infantry Division because they're fighting at Monte Hassero and Leon Forte. Um, and those two battles um, are really uh, very unique in, in how they play out. Leon Forte is actually a, a street battle. It's, it's very similar to what we're going to see in Ortona when we go up there. And in fact, it's one of the regiments who will fight in the streets of Ortona who end up fighting in the streets of Leon Forte. So big learning curve um, for Jim Jefferson and the Loyal Edmonton Regiment. Um, Meanwhile, over on the southeastern flank of, of what is a, which we'll talk about in a moment, the, the big uh, defensive position that the Germans have set up, um, is Monte Asero. It's 906 meters high. It's a big hulking thing in the landscape when you're in Sicily and looking up, particularly from Ditano Station uh, to the south. Uh, looking up at that summit, it, it's a pretty imposing feature and a very, very good defensive position that the Germans had. Um, that 906 meters gives them a complete view of everything down below them. Um, so two very strong positions, both overcome in relatively unique ways that the Canadians had to kind of make up as they went along. Um, so it was a real test of um, their ability to innovate mm -hmm. and and ultimately also their sheer determination um, to succeed. So, and we'll pick both of them apart as, <laughs> as we go along. Yeah, um, I mean, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. No, no, you jump on I was going to say, there's, there's uh, yes, yeah, so sorry, someone's asking for a map. We'll get that up in a second. I just wanted to say, uh, touch on something you said real, real quick there is the, is the ability to adapt to, to, to go, you know, to different changing conditions and to learn on the fly. I mean, I, I did a talk for one of the, the, the field regiments of artillery that was doing a trip over to Sicily. I believe they are 
they were just there. They're back now. I can't remember if they're still there. They're there for the anniversary of the landings. Uh, and that's one of the things I tried to stress to them was this ability to adapt, to improvise, to, to do things differently, but also learn on the fly and, and what that means. And I can't think of a worse place to kind of have a first fight, you know, with the conditions alone. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's a really interesting one. So, yeah, we're uh, let me just get the... Uh, Pulled up here, so yes, it's just uh, real quick. Just again, I picked the photos. There are no photos. I was telling them, talking about Mark, and we'll get into this, but there's not really photos of this fighting. So the photos are just kind of representative. And, and this one's to kind of show the conditions of, you know, the hot and the mountainous terrain, um, which are two of the defining parts of the Sicilian campaign for the Canadians. So here's a, a map just working our way up from the beaches. If you want to just mm -hmm. cover that really quick, maybe more towards Valganera, because that's kind of yeah. important to set it up. Yeah, so the Canadians um, just, and we gave, came up with this at the WW2 TV as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the Canadian job was to be on the left flank of British yep. 8th Army, and they were providing a, basically a contact point with the Americans to their right. Um, and so they're protecting the flank of the British, and they're moving up. And so they're very much uh, from the beach. They were sort of heading up. Mount Etna is up off the map but sitting directly north and so it's this huge massive obstacle no. <laughs> you know you can't you, you got to go around mount etna yeah. one way or the other either on the east or the west and we you were going to go, go around it, it. yeah <laughs> we were going to go go around its western flank and that was yeah. that was the plan um as we get up to and closing in on valgranera and piazza armarina uh, the Canadians are now fighting the Germans rather than Italian troops. They've had a pretty easy advance up until they got to Grandma Kelly and, yep. and hit the Germans. Um, and now they're starting to see increasingly difficult fighting. They're getting into increasingly mountainous terrain. It's getting ever more mountainous. Um, so the physically, the Germans have the advantage in that they own the ground and it's a very good defensive ground. So that's kind of the subtext that we're dealing with. Um, also at this point, the British 8th Army has stalled out in front of Catania. They can't get around there and through and continue the drive. So uh, Montgomery orders 1st Canadian Division to pick up the pace and actually drive the Germans so hard that the Germans will have to shift units away from Catania to face the Canadians. And so that's the plan. And that's, and it's, it's going pretty well with uh, increasing costs to the Canadians. Um, when they come into the Detano Valley, which is actually where that photo you have on the front was, was taken. Right. Um, and the Detano Valley is um, shaped like a horseshoe, uh, basically a bowl. And the temperatures in there are ranging daily uh, 40 to 43 degrees Celsius. It's an incredibly hot place. I've walked through there. And, uh, believe me, you those that's the hardest place to walk. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, but from the town of Station, which is a railway track, um, runs through there and there's a railroad station there, you can see Monte Acero and you can see uh, Leon Forte. And so that was basically what they were doing. And you can see the Detano River. Um, Detano Station is, yeah, just right there. The 48th Highlanders um, little arrow is pointing right at it. Yeah. And Acero is over to the left, up at the top. And Leon Forte uh, looks to be just a short distance away from it. And th that's true. There's, there's just a few kilometers separating the two. Um, but between those two, Acero and Leon Forte are linked by a ridge, um, which doesn't show very well on the map here. Um, but it, uh, there is a, a, a ridge running between the two. And so the Germans had fortified that entire area from Acero to Leonforte. And you, um, you know, people would look at it and say, okay, well, just flank them, 
just go straight up where that hasty p arrow is and get, yeah. get through to Nisiria. Yeah. But it's really, 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 really rugged country. And even today, there's no roads. <laughs> so there's just sort of nowhere you can go to do that. Um, right. you, you could in a number of days of really, really hard climbing and, and marching and stuff, but it, it wouldn't have worked out well. Um, so you, you have to flank through there. The Germans know that. Everybody knows it. So the path is going to be Leon Forte and Acero. And those two, as you can see, if you have a ridge running between them, uh, Acero and Leon Forte anchor it. And yep. so they're the linchpins. You got to get one and you got to get the other. And once you do that, the ridge becomes more or less indefensible and you can roll it up. So the Canadians know that this is the situation they face. Um, the job is given to the um, first infantry brigade and the second infantry brigade. So second brigade is sent to get Leon Forte and first brigade is to try and get, take Acero. Now at the Tano station, they hold a planning session. And so Howard Graham, the brigadier of first brigade, and Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Sutcliffe, who's the commander of the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment, which is going to carry out that attack on Acero, along with his um, intelligence officer, uh, a, a British soldier called Captain Maurice Herbert Battle Cocken, all gather with the Royal Canadian Regiment's Lieutenant Colonel Crow, um, Russ, Ralph Crow, and it's the um, RCR who uh, hold this position where the Titano station is. So they are standing on a little height of ground near the station, looking up at Acero and trying to figure out what to do. And if you look at Acero on the um, western flank of the mountain, there's a road that switchbacks up yep. to the summit. And that road is little changed today from the way it was then. It's still a, a, an awful thing to drive up. Uh, very narrow. Uh, we, we take, a, in Liberation Tours, we take a coach up there oh, every dear. year. <laughs> okay. well, um, it's a challenge for our driver. <laughs> oh, I was not expecting you to say that. <laughs> no. and, and we stop in the town of Acero, and then we get... Um, the, the townsfolk there are really nice and they have a couple of little buses that they, you know, vans that they run our people up to the actual summit. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> so, cause that part's even harder. Oh, yeah. um, but it, it's quite a, it's quite an adventure. Uh, and if you look at that switchback, it's over, overlooked by brush and, um, you know, the shelves of brush and uh, vineyards and olive groves and houses and things like that that have developed over the years since many of those existed in World War II. So the road is basically a no-go zone for any kind of logical attack. The Germans can just be sitting on one shelf after another after another and firing down and, and you have no cover. So they're appreciating that and they start to look at that southeastern side of the mountain. And from photo reconnaissance, they can see there's some goat tracks that run across country there and then start up. Um, there's 40, the mountain has been carved at that point and most of it's kind of fallen away now. But at that point it was carved into 47 stepped shelves, um, each of them being a, a vineyard running along there. Uh, and even in 1943, these had been mostly abandoned and were overgrown, but they provide a kind of, it's kind of like a climbing stairs that yeah. is, is now exists there. You know, they're, yeah. they're sort of seven, eight feet tall. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's it's giant stairs, yeah. but it's a system of stairs. Yeah, and say, that's how I kind of picture this, right? Because we'll yeah. in reading Moet's book, I was like, not stairs it's kind of like a giant ladder i don't know it's hard to hard to what to call it but yeah it's, yeah it's, you know step basically yeah it's it's pretty pretty uh crazy ground yeah. um so they are deciding that that's what they're going to have to do they're going to have to do a night march across country get to the mountain and then start 
climbing up and hopefully yeah. what they are seeing is from the photo reconnaissance is that the Germans have all of their defenses concentrated on the summit of Acero looking down that road um, because to them that's the only logical way it's the only possible way they don't even see that anyone in their right mind could try and climb <laughs> the, this mountain so the Germans disregard that um, but as Bob Wigmore, one of the uh, hasty peas, to said to us in, in uh, July 2013 during Operation Husky 2013, when we were in Sicily, he said, well, the Germans didn't know Canadians, eh? <laughs> 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 um, and so there's, there we go. But a tragedy occurs right here. Um, Ralph Crow, in his wisdom, uh, decides to get the anti-tank platoon who's sitting right next to where uh, they're having their meeting fire a ranging shot toward Monte Acero to determine what the range is between Detano Station and Acero um, rather than getting an artilleryman to come in and figure that out uh, <laughs> big mistake um, so Sherry Atkinson who's the lieutenant in charge of the platoon of anti-tank guns uh says that this is a really bad idea but is told to do it anyway so but he's not wanting to expose his guns um position so he moves one gun over to another spot and then they fire the shot and Crow has left, but or no Crow's there, yeah. Sutcliffe's Crow, Sutcliffe, it's Graham who's left, the brigadier. Right. Uh, so Sutcliffe, Crow, Cocken, and Sherry Atkinson are all there beside the gun. The round gets fired, and literally within seconds, an 88 millimeter round comes slamming right back, uh, explodes right next to the gun, and uh, Sutcliffe is immediately killed, mm -hmm. and Herbert uh, Cock, Battle Cocken is mortally wounded. So the Hasty Peas have now lost a big part of their headquarters section. Um, miraculously, uh, Crow and Atkinson and the gun crew, none of them suffered a scratch from that 88 millimeter shell exploding. So devastating effects on the Hasty Peas doesn't affect anybody else at all. Um, when Cochrane is carried back to the regimental aid post at the Hasty Peas, he's approached by um, uh, Lord Tweedsmere, who is the uh, second in command of the uh, of the Hasty Peas, Major John Tweedsmere. And Cochrane's last dying words as he says to Tweedsmere, for God's sake, don't go up that road. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And Tweedsmere revisits the whole thing, looks at his maps, looks at Monte Acero and says, no, they, the plan's got to be going up the other flank. And so that's where the Hasty Peace set off. Um, and I think probably the easiest way to deal with Leon Forte and Acero is to do one at a time. Yeah. <laughs> so so let's, let's yeah. walk through the Acero attack. Um, so... They set off at night, the Hasty Peas, in single file. Um, they have an assault group that leads the way. It's a, about a 50 men. Um, amongst them is Lieutenant Farley Mowat. Um, and they're, they're going to make the, the first climb. And then the, other, the rest of the Hasty Peas will follow them, assuming this, this thing works, you know, because yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a there's not a lot of confidence actually in the hasty peas as they're going forward that night they're no. blundering around through the dark uh the landscape is 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 this jumble of, of ravines and and uh wild country there there's hardly any agriculture actually even in there it's just it's just wild abandoned country it's really it's, it's what passes for wilderness in sicily and and they're wandering through that um guiding by the stars and, and trying to find their way and they they managed to get to the summit or the um, base of the uh, Monte Acero which is a, an achievement in and of itself um and they haven't been detected uh the um the assault group went with um they're only really carrying their guns ammunition water um that's pretty much it one guy's carrying a great big um 
type 18 radio wireless set mm -hmm. on his back which is uh weighs you know about 50 pounds mm -hmm. uh plus his rifle and his ammunition and and all of that so they're stripped right down um they've taped everything they can possibly tape into place to keep it from jingling and jangling because if the germans hear them coming up that mountain they're dead and they know it and they start that climb and the only way we've talked about these the giant steps um you can't just reach up and pull one guy up so what they do is they boost one guy up then he then they hand up their weapons and stuff to him and then he reaches down and pulls them up and then as they get more and more guys on the shelf they just keep repeating that process and they yeah. do that 47 times uh <laughs> to to get up to the summit so it's a remarkable climb um literally farley mowat uh wrote that that eve that night every hasty pea performed his own private miracle and when you look at that you know and especially when you stand on the top of the summit and you look down all the way to the <laughs> bottom um it's a remarkable thing that they achieved um they get to the summit without being discovered um private called A.K. Long leads the way over the edge of the summit um, and he surprises there's just two Germans on watch duty on that side and I, they're, I can't remember if they're asleep or just distracted or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, he takes them out um, and the rest of the hasty peas come tumbling over the, onto the summit and they just drive forward and they push the uh, the Panzer Grenadiers who are on top of there, the uh, 15th Panzer Grenadier Division. They push them off of the summit and then they dig in. And over the next basically two days, the Germans will do everything in their power to take that summit back. Um, massive counterattacks, massive amounts of artillery called down upon the, uh, the summit. Um, there's an old Norman castle on top of the uh, summit, and underneath it, um, there's a number of caves. Those, um, and I think they're artificial caves that were created by the Normans, but I'm, they might be not not they might be real uh, natural caves as well. I'm not 100 mm. sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, they're turned into the, one of them serves as a regimental aid post where they are sheltering their wounded. Um, they're they didn't have much in the way of, uh, they didn't bring hardly any food with them. They just brought water, but even mm. the, there's no water on top of the mountain. So they're running out of water and they're running out of ammunition. Uh, by the time it gets around to July 22nd and the 48th Highlanders managed to get uh, a supply column up the uh, coming up the same route that they climbed with some basic provisions that keep, keep them going. And then on the, uh, a little later in the 22nd, they attack uh, actually using the road because yeah. the Germans by this time have lost a lot of control of the place and they're able to push up and, and relieve the hasty peas. Um, and so that battle ends successfully with um, us being in control of that hill. Um, Canadian correspondent Ross Munro, who uh, has written, wrote a really good book uh, about his early days in, in Italy, and then he went off to uh, Normandy, of course, like every other journalist did yeah, once, once the invasion was coming. Yeah. And so he wrote of the uh, of the Hasty Peas action on Monte Assaro. He called it the most daring and spectacular operation of the Sicilian campaign. And he's right. And actually, Montgomery also acknowledged that. He said that the mm -hmm. victory on Monte Assaro uh, is, is a tide turner, that at that point, everything tipped and the Germans, you know, they kept on trying to hang on, but the balance has gone the other way. Um, right. The Allies are on the ascendant and, there's, and that battle the outcome of the battle is no longer in question. Like the, the right. campaign is going to be won by the allies. So Monte Assaro, really, really important 
uh, moment for Canadians uh, and what we were doing. Uh, looking at it, uh, very inspirational in that they figured out, like, you gotta remember, uh, the Hasty Peas come from Ontario, <laughs> the middle ground country. Um, my phone's ringing. It'll <laughs> stop ringing shortly. <laughs> a bit of a soundtrack. Yeah. Um, anyway, throw it in a drawer. That'll make it a little quieter. Yeah. It's a good point to stop because we have some people who might not know. So mm -hmm. part that we're talking about, I do have questions about this, as I'm sure you're expecting, is some of these descriptions that we're talking about and these events are recorded by, by Moet because he was a prolific author of all kinds of different mm -hmm. things. But he writes in no word saying about this. So this is a big chunk of it. I just reread it this morning. Um, not reading it too long. Read it uh, not too long ago. Again, rereading it for like the eighth time. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So I just, yeah. if people are wondering kind of where that comes from, some of it mm -hmm. here. Um, and it's a wonderful book. And his other book uh, is called The Regiment, which is also about, uh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> and that one is amazing too, because it's based primarily on the regiment, the regimental war diaries. Yeah. Uh, after Ortona, um, Farley Mowat, um, I believe was suffering from PTSD. Um, yeah. And he was removed from combat command functions as a platoon commander and made the intelligence officer of the ASDPs, yeah. um, which was, you know, when you think about it literally, uh, in a literary sense, yeah. what a wonderful thing to have happen. You have a, a guy who's going to become one of the most famous authors in Canadian history yeah. uh, writing the war diary. Yeah. Uh, and and it's it's a remarkable document. Like um, yeah. you know, there's pages and pages and pages of material on say, each yeah, battle. Just to, just to jump in because I did mm -hmm. gone through them, um, and it's just it's still even today when I see it, see his signature there, it still throws me off. I mean, I mean, I know it's him, but I mean, it's just yeah. so, so weird to see. And you can tell because I was doing it with with Project Forty Four, who, who had transcribed all of these to put it in with their map. And we were working on that because we were finishing it up. And it, it, it's just, you can tell when he takes over. <laughs> it just it changes the tone. There's literally more. It, it's just all this stuff. Um, it's, it's it's a really interesting one. But yeah. and, and what I do want to ask you, if that's okay for right now, <laughs> is, how do I say this? Because Moet sometimes, and he said it himself, <laughs> would exaggerate. He's like to say, you know, don't let facts get in the way of a story. So for just this particular point, is the stuff from in your research and your experience is is from from this assault? Is it pretty much match up with everything else that you've seen on this? It does, um, because Tweedsmere himself wrote an account of the battle as well, and it it, it jibes really well with with the uh, war diaries. Um, Bob Wigmore, who was uh, the uh, Hasty P veteran I mentioned earlier, um, when he was with us in Operation Husky 2013, we talked about the thing and, and he described it from the ground. He, they were at the base of the hill, a, a group of uh, young, young, very fit Canadians uh, yeah. climbed, climbed Monte Acero as part of that. And um, he, was, he gave them a whole briefing. Uh, before okay. they started set off, and and he described it very uh, in in good, really good detail. So I think, yeah, I think the uh, Monte Acero a victory. Um, I didn't. I don't think Moet needed to embellish yeah. it. <laughs> the story stands. Yeah, you don't really need to exaggerate that one because um, literally the ground is as you already described it. It's changed in some ways, but. Yeah, it's pretty hard to miss. So it's kind of hard to you don't need to make that one up because, as you said, it's a, such a distinctive point in, in all of this. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's one of those things that always comes up, right? And, mm -hmm. and one day I hope to do some more digging into Moet because he's written. Or was the other one? I don't know, I have back there behind me somewhere. Um, so much mm -hmm. about his experiences and some of the changes. And anyway, mm -hmm. I want to look into that. So I had to ask. Um, so just yeah. a, a quick question, kind of more about the overall. Sorry, I must went to sleep. Uh, a strategic situation. So is uh, from the Great Dominion here, did the shift in German forces away from uh, Catania area begin around this time? Yes, you started to see some soaking off um, to fill the lines in front of the um, 
Canadians, uh, particularly first uh, Falsham Jagger division units start getting moved away from where they had been were doing very effective work against the British on in the Catania area. They start they need to be swung over and join the defensive lines um, in front of us. Uh, that takes a few days to actualize, and so it's more in the uh, advance towards Ajira that they start showing up on the ground. But um, we are seeing a, a shift happen. And, and the Germans, um, they see, like the, the real thing about Monte Acero is again, these guys, no climbing experience, um, mm. climb the mountain and get away with it and figure it out. Uh, the Germans start calling the uh, Canadians yeah. at this point mountain boys. Yeah. And they, they tell uh, Kesselring that we're up against a seasoned mountain division uh <laughs> well the, the canadians were anything but that they they, they had had two days of, of training in in northern scotland around Inverary. uh but, but you know it was hardly mountain training and they were hardly a mountain division yeah it just, but, uh, it's such an interesting contrast to me for her because i live not too far away from, from prince edward county and it's the almost opposite of mountain. <laughs> <'Cause it's, you laughs> exactly. Know, it's just into Lake Ontario and it's very flat. It's known for its wineries nowadays. So I think that can tell you all you need to know about that is the flat openness. So it's it's just yeah. so interesting. Um, yeah. And someone's asking, no, they're not. These, this unit, no, is not the prairies. This is Ontario. This is uh, Prince Edward County. And yeah. County in Eastern Ontario, which is, I live in Ottawa, so it's west of me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's not. It was all mountain. It was farm. They they were mostly farmers and okay. or um, th there was still a forest industry that existed no. at that time in Hastings and Prince Edward County. I th don't imagine there's any forest left now. <laughs> but um, so that was kind of the life that they were used to. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah, so totally. different thing. And you know the point is is that at this stage of the war those militia regiments yeah. are still it's still all the guys from the same region are in them this yep. will change as the war goes on and casualties take away more and more men um then you start getting the reinforcement pool they'll start sending you know a guy from saskatchewan gets sent to the hdps or wherever yeah. um but at this point in the war they're very much, even as they're suffering casualties, they're drawing them out of a pool of hasty peas that are back yep. at Bark West. And so that's, you know, the whole Sicily campaign, everyone is part of their regimental um, background. If, if they, yeah. You know, so, yeah, so that, that changes very quickly um, mm -hmm. because of the number of casualties and also just strategic situation anyway we're not really here to talk about that today but there's just lots of factors that go into that yeah. and, and north africa becomes part of it because it's the, the backup for this and mm -hmm. uh, anyway so yeah no but that's a really good point um it's uh it still has that association with its area uh i mean reading the, the you know moet's work on this and all the names and the word diaries and everything it's it, it's clear that everybody knows everybody pretty much mm -hmm. i mean uh, Tweedsmere is clearly not from there because he's the, you know, the son of the former governor general. Yes. Uh, there are characters like that that stick out. But generally speaking, and because Moet likes to go into those details and, and, and everything mm -hmm. like that, about the personal uh, backgrounds of people in certain cases and kind of develops that character development, you can see why he became the author that he did. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's an important point to, uh, to remember. Now, I think Norma will scream at me if I don't ask this question about uh, Bert Kennedy calling down uh, artillery after kind of scaling <laughs> to the top. I was wondering if you could talk about really briefly about that, because then I do. Yeah. Want to, uh, so, to yeah. So um, one of the things that Bert Kennedy realized was that they needed, they really needed artillery, but um, they themselves didn't have an artillery officer with them. There was no right. forward observation officer who went up with them. And, uh, he realizes that the Germans had on the summit um, an actual range-finding telescope yeah. for their own gunnery. 
And um, again, rather improvisational, um, Kennedy's experience in artillery direction was pretty weak. <laughs> you know, he's an infantry officer. Yeah. Uh, him and Tweedsmere actually sort of knocked it around and figured this thing out. Yeah. And then they, they get, they're able to uh, connect with the artillery and direct pretty accurate fire against yeah. uh, the counterattacks that the Germans are trying to throw up the hill. And the Germans, interestingly, in their counterattacks, still thinking that the mountain was impossible to climb, are generally coming up the road at them. Yeah. You know, so yeah. so they've they've now fallen into the trap that they tried to set for um, for the Canadians, and uh, so it makes it interesting inter thing there. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting part of, of the story again, showing that well, not I don't even know if improvisation is the right word when it's all you have. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's it's pretty much that was it because um, that was yeah. the only way to do it because, like you said, they carried that set up, and I was just at the War Museum last week. Camp War Museum here in Ottawa, and I was in the back because I got a little bit of a tour. I was trying to find one of those sets. I didn't have much time, so mm -hmm. I to, you know, big it would have been, you know, strap that thing that's meant to be in a carrier on your back to go up the mountain. But it, it turned out to work as it should have in that sense because I don't think mm -hmm. without it, I don't think they would have been able to hold on. And, and, no, and it says that, and he's not the only one. Yeah, no, the wireless set was key because they wouldn't have had any way of communicating. And and they and so now they're able to direct artillery yeah. using the uh, German equipment, uh, but are then linked to the wireless set that they have. Um, yeah. Okay. So one more quick question: um, Why didn't they have a foo with them at this point? I think it was partly uh, the Canadians are still learning, um, <laughs> yeah. and it's really an oversight. Uh, yeah, you, okay. you won't see it as, as you go on in the Sicilian campaign, you don't see that. You see the, yes, the, there's a forward observation officer generally always with, with each battalion. Um, at this point, you, what you saw was forward observation officers at brigade level and, right. and that's useful. <laughs> but not not when your battalion goes off on its own uh, and, is, and is unsupported by the brigade. The, the brigade yeah. can't see, so the forward observation officers right. with them can't see how to direct the fire. So there, there yeah. we are. Yeah. Uh, and I think really that's learning. That's where you start learning from your mistakes. Um, yeah. When that's over, you think, well, we're not going to do that one again. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of mistakes that I learned about this one, but, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So like I said, I don't know if I said it earlier, but I've linked all its stuff down below and yours as well, Mark, your books. So if people want to get the in-depth of our depth, in-depth dive today, more in-depth, it's in there. Um, you know, the sensory right. of all of this, everything that Mark has researched on this for a long time is all in those books. So that's a good way. So now we got to move on to uh, Leon Forte. So this is a totally different battle. Um, it's on the other side of the uh, ridge, as we mentioned. It's uh, Leon Forte is an oblong-shaped town. It's got about a twenty thousand population, and so the town's oblong runs a kilometer in length, roughly. It's set up on another height of ground, so it's a hilltop town. Actually, almost all towns in in the interior of Sicily are hilltop yeah, towns. Pretty much, um, and there's they're formidable uh, defensive positions as a result. And of course, they were built on the hilltops in the medieval era because of the defensibility. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the whole point. Um, so there they are, and originally. It was supposed to be the Seaforth Highlanders who put in the attack on, on Leonforte, but just as they're getting ready to gear up and go, um, their headquarters section is hit by a stonk of um, friendly artillery fire that falls short. Um, nobody, there's a few guys seriously injured, but they're not pivotal people to, to the, the um, headquarters section but everyone's knocked about really pretty badly um bert hoffmeister who's the um, lieutenant colonel commanding the regiment uh is actually concussed right. um so he basically tells um brigadier major Gen or, um, brigadier general uh, chris Vokes that we we can't do this attack now we'll need at least 24 hours to reorganize um, Vokes 
knows he doesn't have 24 hours, so he swaps the lo the loyal eddies uh, into into the attack instead. Um, again, they there's not a lot of support that they bring down. Uh, they they don't want to hit uh, Leon Forte with a lot of heavy artillery because, of course, there's twenty thousand Italians or Sicilians in there. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, and they kind of convince themselves that they're not going to have a hard fight. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, another mistake that uh, we make. A, there was an overconfidence, I think, at this point. Yeah. Because of the successes. I was going to say, yeah, I don't... I'm not disagreeing with you at all, but I don't even know. Sometimes the English language, I, I say this before, is kind of limiting because I don't, I don't know if it's overconfidence. It could be ignorance mixed with overconfidence because it's just... Yeah. And you sit, and sit for a second and you go, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, they're always suffering from really lousy maps. Yeah, um, the, the maps were generally based on uh, Italian army maps. Yeah. And the Italian army maps were notoriously inaccurate. So, you know, you don't have a good appreciation of the land around the town and how right. it can be helped with the defense of the town. Um, so Jim Jefferson, who's the Lieutenant Colonel commanding uh, the Eddies, um, leads them into the town very quickly. They go in at night. Um, they attack at 9.30 p.m. on July 21st. Um, so it's getting dark. Um, and very quickly, the size of the town kind of overwhelms the Eddies. They, he ends up having to bring all four companies in to make any kind of forward movement. Um, so they're pushing forward uh, on a four company line, uh, which, you know, is just really bad strategy all around. You don't have any reserves anymore. Yeah. You, you've got, you know, really nothing. You're just throwing everything forward. Um, they walk into uh, very heavy fighting because the uh, Germans counterattack with uh, tanks and infantry. And we don't have any tanks in there with the Eddies. So Jefferson realizes the whole thing's going to hell and he orders a withdrawal. But there's a hundred Eddies, including himself, who can't break contact with the, uh, the, the fighting Germans. Um, they're also split up into little groups. Uh, that are fighting independently all over. Jefferson's got about 30 guys. He's down in a cellar uh, fighting from that one building. And he realizes they're going to get wiped out if they don't get reinforcement. And he manages to find a 10-year-old boy <laughs> whose name is Antonio Gius, Gius, Gio, Giuseppe. Um and he writes a note and he gives it to the boy with a few lira uh, stuck in his pocket and says, you go find a senior Canadian and get them to send help. This kid manages to slip through the German lines, get back out uh, and finds Chris Vokes of all things, uh, <laughs> hands him the note <laughs> and Vokes says, oh, I hate it. <laughs> okay. He knows now where Jefferson is because it included the location. Um, and he sets up to get, puts together a rescue attempt uh, using the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, which is the third battalion of Second Brigade. Um, he mounts them up on tanks of the Three Rivers Regiment, and they also are towing four six pounder anti tank guns from 90th Anti Tank Battery on trucks. And they start to try and break into, at dawn on the 22nd, break into Leon Forte. Uh, the first attempt is pushed back. Um, they go again the second time. And during this process, during the night, the Canadian engineers had managed to build a Bailey Bridge across um, a ravine that's mostly dry. It's got a little bit of water in it, but it's mostly dry. And they did this under fire. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the first Bailey Bridge to be constructed by the Allies in a combat situation. 
Yeah. Um, so another little historical yeah. moment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and actually there's engineers in Sicily right at this point, and yeah. I believe on July 22nd, they're unveiling a monument at that crossing point um, to um, honor the uh, engineers and what they did. Yeah, I, um, I knew about that. I totally forgot. Yeah, they're yeah, they're yeah. Right now, yeah. I, I was trying to help them at one point. We were they were looking for photographs of the building of the bridge. Right. Um, it seems they don't exist. I wouldn't uh, think so. Um, so it, it's yeah. um, unfortunate. You know, of course, the work was done at night, and yeah, but you yeah. know, there doesn't even seem to be a picture of the bridge after the fact. I don't think so. <laughs> Not, which, not, uh, not easily accessible anyway. Yeah, which is yeah. kind of frustrating. But anyway, there we go. Um, so they, uh, the tanks, infantry, and anti-tank guns are able to row across the bridge, thankfully. And they're able to fight their way into Leonforte. And at this point, you know, then it just becomes typical house clearing. Bang, 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 bang. You're just pushing forward. And the Germans very quickly realize that the game is up and they, they pull back. And in doing, as they withdraw, we take Leon Forte. By the end of the day, June, July 22nd, it's in Canadian hands. The ridge now becomes irrelevant because um, you've got the two linchpins taken out. So they're going to, you know, they, they um, fall back to their next line of, of defenses, which is based around Niseria. And you can see up there on that map. There's another big bunch of hills and, and uh, positions there. And that will be the scene of yet more fighting. And you can see how the progression goes until August the 7th, when we get uh, finally to a Durano, which is on the foothills of the uh, Mount Etna. Yeah. And that's where the Canadian advance stops. Um, by this time, they've been they're it's no longer needed for them to keep going they're going to get in the way of the 51st british division if they if they keep advancing so they stand down to let the british um slide by and uh carry on towards messina so in that three days we um suffered 275 casualties first division and that was the highest losses that they suffered in uh, the entire Sicilian campaign for a similar period. So really costly. Um, and lessons learned being, you know, uh, don't make up your plans on the fly like they did with the attack on Leon Forte. Um, you know, it was kind of typical Chris Vokes. Uh, you know, just <laughs> let's just hack a battalion forward and see what happens. <laughs> He's not going to learn to, uh, learn to not do this for a long time, when, even when he becomes divisional commander. I was going to say, does um, he ever learn that lesson? Um, well, yeah, there's a lot of debate on that. I, I think not. <laughs> I don't know either. Um, he's worse than that, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. but then to another place where he did that way too later in the war in an entirely different part of the continent when he should have learned that lesson. Uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah. that's the point there. But it, it's, yeah, sorry, was there anything else you want to add there, Mark? Uh, it, uh, it, you know, I think this action stands as uh, one of the, you know, one of the, uh, if, if we look at Canadian operations at a divisional level, this stands as a one of the most momentous battles that a division fought in, in, in World War II, really. Yeah. Uh, and it tends to not get recognized in that way. Right. Um, but, you know, we, we've seen that with the whole Sicilian campaign. You know, it, it lived in a shadow for um, right. ever. You know, it was really, yeah. it sort of started to come out of the shadows when um, the Montreal businessman Steve Gregory launched Operation Husky 2013. Yeah. And now, of course, he's back in Sicily with Operation Husky 2023. And I'm heartened to see that now he's actually being able to attract some national press and national yeah. TV coverage. Yeah. Whereas when we were over there in 2013, nah, no, no, <laughs> it nothing. didn't happen. No, no, no way. Um, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, they've been getting some, I know, like I was talking about that regiment that went over the field regiment they got on uh, italian tv so that was pretty cool um they were getting national attention for that and it, it, it's it's really interesting that i think that this is what's shifting 
I mean, I don't think it's ever going to come up to the level that is the behemoth that is Normandy, but uh, no. it, it's getting the attention I think it should be getting. Because again, I was going to, and there I have a question for that leads, that's part of this, but in terms of the recognition. And, and like you said, at the divisional level, this is first division, I mean, is learning um, what's going on. And it, it's just, it, it's, it's a shame that it's not better known. And, and one of the things that comes up when you talk about these twin battles, if you want to call it that, uh, is the gallantry medals. I'm sure you probably knew this was coming. Um, mm -hmm. How there are none awarded for Asoro, but at Leona Forte, there's a lot given out. Mm -hmm. um, now, I've heard that that's kind of because of what happens inside the HDPs with the amount of casualties they take afterwards. Um, do you know of anything about that, of of why that is, or is it because Vokes was not, you know, more involved in Liana Forte than he was at Asoro? I think it's partly um, Vokes and and the uh, Second Brigade commanders were very good at um, making sure that they wrote up the medal citations. There was. Um, a, it seemed like a bit of a reluct reluctance on the part of First Brigade. Uh, up to the Brigadier Howard Graham level right. uh, to write people up for medals. Okay, he's he's not as bad as there are some of them. Where there was a couple of brigadiers who sort of said, "Well, nobody's going to get nobody gets an award until I do," oh, <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but he he wasn't quite that bad. Um, so I think it was there was a tendency the hasty peas didn't. Um, didn't write up the people that they should have. And maybe that reflects the factor that Sutcliffe was dead. Um, and and so Tweedsmere probably, Tweedsmere had his hands full trying to run <laughs> run, a, run a battalion, um, yeah. you know, he's second in command and, and um, suddenly he's now the commander. Um, right, yeah. So I think, and also, I, I don't think Tweedsmere stayed on that much longer. No, he didn't. He, got, uh, he, got, he gets uh, sick. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah then he disappears, yeah, and he uh, and so there's no advocate, if you will, right? Um, where um, the Sea Force, uh, there, there's a number of citations that oh, come yeah. out of Leon Forte because they did join the battle after the uh, Eddies were in the town and they were fighting on the outskirts. Um, now, Hofmeister was the kind of guy who was very, very uh, good at, at seeing that his his um, men were, were recognized for them. Right. Uh, he's already showing this amazing ability to work with troops that um, yeah. will come into the fore when he becomes the brigadier of 2nd Brigade and Vokes goes on to divisional command. And then after Ortona, um, Hofmeister gets his own divisional command with the, with the 5th Armored Division Army, yeah. um, and emerges from the war generally with um, everyone even up to Granitstein saying, you know, he was the best divisional commander of the Canadian <laughs> forces. Um, so different ways of approaching it yeah oh for sure i mean it just, just have it well literally i was i was, I was asking you that uh, uh, dave patterson is <laughs> literally types this out as i was literally asking there we are Here we are uh, <laughs> certainly minds. um so so norma i know norma who i had a question from earlier because i was helping her with some stuff with, related to uh, burke kennedy he's been digging into this quite intensively mm -hmm. So she says in the war diary that these TPs didn't even know they had to apply for the gallantry medals. Um, which that, is that's, um, that, that, that could well be. Yeah. Uh, and know. then Dave also says because Graham was in, in the HDPs, he didn't want to favor his old unit. Um, mm, that's a good point, too. It sounds like something Graham would say based on mm -hmm. how he's described by others anyway. Because um, mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever actually read anything he's written or anything like that. He but. did. He did. Uh... He did write a book. Uh, I can't he did. I just haven't got it. Yeah, yeah, I've, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, so but, there you go. So that's an uh, interesting part of this of why. I mean, because it just kind of how do I say this? Because sometimes it comes up in that sense. Because I, I did that talk, and, and people are like, "Oh no, the hasty peas got ignored," or something like that. And I'm like, I don't, "Don't. That's not why. It's just there's other sets of circumstances that lead to." what mm -hmm. happened here it's not like one brigade is being favored over the other in terms of medals and things like that that they're a more appreciated unit or something because i think with 
with Moet's work, HTPs is probably one of the best known regiments anyway. <laughs> uh, because Moet is was required reading and still is mm -hmm. in schools, right? So it's a yes. known around. Well, well, the reg the regiment was is the only regimental history I know of that became a, a national bestseller. <laughs> yeah, <know? laughs> so. I think so. Um, that's a, which is a testimony to his uh, writing skills. Well, yeah, it's only the well, it's the only. Well, how do you say this? Because it's because cheap doesn't sound right, but it's only ones that is like accessible price wise. Because the rest are all out of print; you can't find them. Whereas mm -hmm. the regiment, you can pop on I have the link on Amazon right now and go get it. Now, I think that just mm -hmm. speaks to its to its popularity and and Moet and everything like that. Yeah, um, and the Hasty yeah. Peas have the Hasty Peas have brought it back into print because oh, yeah. in, in 2013 I got a copy from them. Yeah, well I don't blame them. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, if anyone, sorry, I just want to trump this in real quick. If anyone has any uh, questions, please uh, drop them in because we'll wrap up shortly. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to, to kind of cover that one because I think it's. And, and uh, Norma's talking about again how Burke Kennedy becomes mm -hmm. CEO. Like that's what I was trying to help her with and track and all that. Mm -hmm. um, just the HCPs go through so many command changes. I think that has a part to play. And then Dave again is talking about the militia role because that comes up a lot, right? In terms of leadership positions, um, you know, permanent force as the regular army is popularly known at the time, you know, versus the militia. And, mm -hmm. and you don't really see that yet. Because this is still early, right? This is very mm. early days, right? Because this is literally nine days after the landing. This is the first major prolonged uh, divisional Canadian divisional attack in the war. So mm. it, it's definitely something uh, to keep in mind. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's an interesting thing the the uh, militia being favored versus the permanent force in a, in a way, with in some people's view, and yet, yeah, some, yeah. and yet we go over to like the Royal Canadian Regiment, for example, <laughs> um, and you've got Strong, Strong Galloway, who comes out of the reserves, yeah. and it's made pretty clear to him all the way through the war, he's never going to command that regiment, mm -hmm. uh, even though a lot of people are acknowledging that he certainly deserves the command of the regiment. I mean, yeah, he probably should have, but... Uh... But it ain't going to happen because he's not permanent force. <laughs> he had a bit of a, a, bit of a, a chip on his shoulder on that one. <laughs> Ah uh, yeah, I, I, I knew Strom well, and it was uh, every every time we had a beer, it came up in conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's literally uh, um, title of the book, you know, the general who never was. Uh, yeah. I think it's just so it's so because again, I don't like these labels, right? Of what's Canadian, what's not Canadian, but we expect you know Canadians to be demure and, and not that egotistical, and yet there's that book, <laughs> so it's just so yeah. To me, it, it, it's it, it's quite funny that that. Uh, but anyway, that's not one of the regiments here. We can always maybe talk about the RCR. Have you back on um, maybe in the fall or in the winter to talk about um, the mainland because that's coming mm -hmm. up as well. Are, yeah. are you going over there again for that? Or anything yes, like that? actually, I'm going to be uh, where Liberation Tours is doing an October Italian campaign tour. Oh, nice. Um, and it's it's actually back to back. I'm going over in uh, the end of September to do. Um, one a new tour that we're doing called oh, okay. uh, the Cinderella camp, uh, Cinderella tour, our army tour, right? <laughs> uh, where we're going to go follow the uh, First Canadian Army all the way from the UK up through Normandy into uh, Northern Holland. Um, oh, that'll be fun. So yeah, it's it's uh, we it's brand new. Um, it's, I think it's going to be a really good one. And then we have about four days off, and we pick up the Italian oh, campaign tour in Sicily and and oh, take them up Sicily. And this coming May, um, in the Leary Valley area, right. the uh, communities there are really um, planning some pretty major ceremonies, uh, working in conjunction with the uh, Canadian em Embassy okay. um, yeah. to honor the Canadians in the Leary Valley campaign. So the Hitler line, the Melfa River, that kind of thing. Oh, well, that'll be cool. So that's, um, that should be good. Uh, and we're going to be there as part of that uh, with our Liberation Tours group. Awesome. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's the interesting thing is as well is uh, the Canadian participation in the Italian campaign is getting an enormous amount of honorifics from the Italian population. 
Mm -hmm. um, we, we're really seeing that, you know, the Italians, the communities we went through, you know, they, they do remember and now they're working mm -hmm. on, you know, there's monument projects and there's educational projects in the schools to teach the kids about it. And um, so it's really heartening to see. Because there's this, this kind of myth that we have that, you know, the Dutch remember us, and then, right. you know, but nobody else, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, we're seeing that that's not the case, you know. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's good to see. Yeah, that's great to hear. And uh, I mean, I know there's a little bit going on and always going on in Larry Valley. So that, that's great um, to hear about, especially because we... With casino, we tend to get forgotten, <laughs> and mm -hmm. that is just—I mean, casino. I think is worthy of that attention, but uh, there is a campaign past that, you know, that mountain. Yes, um, there exactly. Are, the rest of it still need to be taken. Uh, the Germans didn't mm -hmm. just say we're done. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was a, a really, really good point to hear and everything that. So maybe we'll have you back on uh, to talk about that and and all those different ones and, and the. I'm sure, we'll have you back on to talk about that and hear your experiences once you maybe come back because I'd like to hear more about you know just what the people in italy are doing and what they're thinking and how they sure. are doing this i think that would be great to hear uh, yeah and, yeah and it's one of it's, it's one of the things i really um you know i love about uh doing the italian campaign tour because it's you know we're in bumping into canadian you know there's some organized stuff that we always do where we meet different people specifically but there's also just these crazy things that happen where, you know, um, like we were at point two Oh four once and this little car comes roaring up and parks in the parking lot. And this guy gets out and he, he says, you know, he was like 15 years old when, um, when that battle happened, oh, okay, he was yeah, actually yeah, yeah. in a, he was actually in a farmhouse just down the road from point two Oh four. And wow. he was describing, you know, and the Canadians were shooting and the Germans were shooting and then the Canadians were shooting and the Germans were shooting and he's <laughs> down in the basement trying to stay alive. And, uh, and it was just great, you know, cause they were totally spontaneous. You know, he was just on his way to the store or something. Yeah, I saw, love those, saw those Canadians and, yeah. and said, I got to talk to the Canada Daisy. <laughs> I love those stories. Yeah. I've had a few of those myself. Yeah. It's always great to run into people who are, like I lived right over there, you know, when that happened, it's it's always great to to hear those stories. So yeah, we'll definitely yeah. hopefully get you. Well, we'll have you back, and then maybe we can schedule yeah. it for once you're back, and maybe have sure. a rest. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a lot of planes for you um, having to go oh, yeah. those different areas. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, so thanks again, Mark. Really appreciate well, thank it. Thank you, Brad. Um, we can uh, we're getting some more attention on this, and I think uh, this sounds like more like a movie than a real life. And probably should be a movie. And maybe if it wasn't Canadian, it might have been. Um, yeah. but, uh, That's true. Yeah. So anyway, um, we got some more questions rolling in, but maybe we'll uh, we'll do something with those later. Uh, okay. We'll talk about those at another time because I think this is a natural stopping point. So uh, yeah. thanks everyone for uh, for hanging out, giving Mark some good questions, and uh, for Mark for coming on. Uh, if you want to support the channel, you can do through through Patreon uh, or become a YouTube channel member. Uh, those are very helpful and help with the Canada Normandy project I got coming up. So thanks again everyone for watching. And on the 25th, I'll have uh, Alex Black on the channel talk about the RCAF in Sicily. So. Great. Look forward to that one. That'll be a good one. So uh, yeah. other than that, everyone have a good uh, uh, rest of your day, and we'll see you next time. Bye, Thank everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Thanks.